uh, yeah, I'm excited. This is a really wonderful week, uh, Holy Week. Uh, one of the things that we are going to be doing is sending out uh, daily meditations. Um, I think we're, Kristen, we're going to have it on the website. I can't remember. Oh, oh yeah. That, also that too. Uh, we're going to have daily meditations. Uh, each day of Holy Week uh, is something significant to remember about uh, Jesus' last week. Uh, before his crucifixion and resurrection. Um, and if you guys haven't had a chance to kind of every single day sort of follow uh, Jesus along, um, it's really interesting kind of a practice to do. This is kind of why we encourage this and it's why I put together these meditations, just to kind of have us reflect on these different things. So I uh, look forward to that. Uh, it, one of the things I just really want to quickly do is to give a huge thanks uh, to two groups of people. First, Everyone who helped us to build the playground. Uh, and it is just absolutely stunning. Um, we had a bunch of people come yesterday to help fill in the mulch. And that was like, you know, many hands make light work, right? We had like 15 people here. That was cranked out in like two hours. So a uh, huge blessing. Um, and, of course, I just want to say MVP award goes to Jared, wherever he's at. He's over there. I know he probably doesn't want me drawing attention to him, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, he was just, uh, he was probably the, like, the biggest help. I mean, he, like, researched everything, mulch, the retaining wall, the playgrounds, put together, like, a proposal, sent it to us, down to, like, the exact cost of everything, and it came in right at the cost. It was, like, actually really impressive. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just want to say, um, you know, everyone helped in major ways, but I would say he probably gets the MVP award. Not that that's really a thing in heaven, but... I, it's Jesus gets it. But uh, anyway, the second thing I want to say is thanks to Kevin last week for preaching. I really appreciated the time off, but also just appreciated your message, brother. That was really, really encouraging to be reminded that this is the day. You know, we all we have is today. This is the only day that we get is today. Tomorrow is never promised. And yesterday already, already happened, right? So today is the only day that we get to live, uh, to live it for the Lord. And I think I was especially challenged when, he's, when he kind of asked the question, like if you were to uh, have someone know that you went to church and were a Christian, would that actually be a surprise? <laughs> you know, that was a great little, I think, uh, encouragement for me, too, uh, because my wife and I are in a, a lot of different circles in San Diego, especially in the homeschooling community. And sometimes it's a little bit surprising when they hear that I'm a pastor. And, and not always a bad way is that surprising, but, um, you know, it certainly got me thinking about that. So thank you, Kevin, for for that encouragement. Yeah. So join us next week for Easter uh, Resurrection Sunday, as I like to call it. And uh We'll be inside, bring a friend, um, and we'll be inside after that, too. All right. Look at the good stuff. Today is Palm Sunday. Uh, today is the day that we traditionally, as a church, remember uh, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, uh, hailed as the king. His kind of, the, we call the triumphal entry of Jesus as king, and he's hailed uh, as this Messiah king. And he rides on this donkey, uh, and we call it Palm Sunday, likely because of all the different branches that were cut and laid at the feet of the donkey. We'll read that in a moment. I love this picture of Jesus uh, because he's being acknowledged uh, by the people and being hailed as this promised Messiah King. There's a lot of joy that is experienced when we read the account of this entry. We'll read from Matthew's gospel of this account, and it's just a very joy-filled uh, kind of a scene that we have. And this Holy Week, you know, every year we have kind of a different theme when we think about Jesus' death and his resurrection, kind of a theme that we kind of focus on because there's, you know, kind of like his death and resurrection is kind of like a jewel, right? There's so many different facets and aspects of it that can really encourage us where we're at now. And this year, I really wanted to kind of focus on the idea of transformation, how our lives are transformed through Jesus. And we have different kind of uh, themes each day of Holy Week. We'll kind of focus on that this morning. We're going to talk about transformed joy. And the big idea that we're going to focus on as we read Matthew 21 is that Jesus' entrance into our lives transforms our joy. His entrance into our lives is meant to transform our joy. Often those things that we used to find joy in, when Jesus comes into our life, actually those things begin to now pale in comparison to the joy that Jesus is and the joy that he brings. So if you guys will go ahead and stand with me in honor of reading of God's word. This is Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. I'll read it, declare it to be God's word. We'll thank him for it together as a family, and I'll pray and commit our time to the Lord. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, 
Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you uh, that we can have joy and we can have joy in you. Father God, I thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus, to transform our joy. Jesus, so many ways uh, that we try to find joy in the things of this world and the things of the flesh, and it just doesn't work. And so, Jesus, I pray today that our joy would be stirred up. Jesus, I I pray that our joy would be found in you and that we'd have not just uh, the presence of joy, but really the experience of it as well uh, today. And so, Jesus, I pray that as we focus on you, that you would be honored and be lifted high in our hearts and our minds and our words. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I've got just two points for us as we kind of unpack these 11 verses, the call to joy and the experience of joy. And what's striking about this passage as we begin to take a look at it is the intentional way that Jesus chooses to enter into this city. I mean, he enters in. It's not the first time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. I mean, if we know anything about Jesus' ministry on earth, that he had spent a lot of time in and around Jerusalem. I mean, he certainly was not an unknown player. So for the city to say, who is this? We'll get to that in a moment. That's not, they're not really asking, who is this? That's not because they know who this guy is. Uh, but it's interesting is he, this time, chooses to enter in a way that would be intentionally fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy regarding the Messiah King that God had promised his people for so long. He tells his disciples to go get a donkey that had never been ridden before, and then he rides on it into the city. And the prophecy is from a prophet named Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. And this is the prophecy in the Old Testament. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So obviously Jesus is in real time fulfilling this prophecy. And then the people know it. I mean, they, they can see this thing happening. Zechariah was a very well-known prophecy regarding the Messiah. And notice how this kind of call to this Old Testament prophecy It starts with a call to joy. It starts with a call for rejoicing. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. I was thinking about this uh, kind of idea of like shouting, you know, uh, in our staff meeting this week, we're kind of discussing when we shout, oftentimes exuberantly, um, we don't shout like mean things, right? Like, hey, you know, we shout excitedly about good, happy things. Like I was thinking about my kids. And then when I come home from work, my kids like, like will tackle me, you know, shouting "Papa, Papa, Papa, Papa," you know. Even like my littlest Malachi like does his little happy dance, you know. Uh, and it is really nice to come home to that. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, you know. It's really loud, but it's you know I, I appreciate that. So I, that kind of the same kind of idea I had as I was reading this is like, ah, that sounds familiar. But it's a call to rejoicing. It's a call to joy. But notice that the the joy is anchored not in our circumstances. The the joy, the rejoicing we have isn't anchored in our present situation or even in ourselves, right? The the, the joy, the rejoicing we have is anchored in the Messiah King, this humble Messiah King who's coming with both righteousness and salvation because Jesus is the embodiment of righteousness and he gives his salvation. And it's really the presence of this Messiah King himself that is cause for worship and for honor. The very presence of the Messiah King is cause for joy and for rejoicing. Now, this call for rejoicing, even when we don't feel like it, uh, is echoed all over the place in the New Testament. There's a lot of places where we see this, especially uh, this call to joy and to rejoicing is often as a response to the gospel. Consider Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord again, always. 
I say, rejoice. And that's, a, that's an imperative, right? It's a commandment we're given to rejoice always, period, hard stop. No matter what happens in our lives, our, the call is to rejoice. I think that, again, this ought to remind us that true joy comes as a response to the gospel. It's not anchored in emotions, right? Joy is not an emotion. Happiness is an emotion, but joy is not. It's something other than that. And it's not anchored in feelings of happiness or sadness, but joy is anchored really in the reality of the Spirit of God in us. And our joy is present in us because God is a happy God. I mean, Tim, uh, John Piper came out with his book, Desiring God, like decades ago, and it like rattled Christianity in America. Right? We're like, oh, yeah, God's a happy God. We kind of forget about that reality, that God is a happy God, and his happiness is given to us by his Spirit in Christ. Joy is really a settledness of knowing that I am God's and that he is mine. All that he is, is mine, including his joy. Sometimes we think of God being this angry, judge, judging, kind of vengeful God, right? Especially when we read through these crazy stories in the Old Testament. And you know what? Sometimes he is. <laughs> like, I'm not going to say he's not. You can't read the Old Testament and not come away with the reality that God does not like sin, that he punishes sin, that there is a consequence for sin. Sometimes he is angry, but that is not all that he is. He is a happy God who delights in all his work. He delights in his people, and he delights first and foremost in himself. Uh, Tim Keller says, The life of the Trinity is characterized not by self-centeredness, but by mutually self-giving love. When we delight and serve someone else, we enter into a dynamic orbit around him or her. We center on the interests and desires of the other. That creates a dance, particularly if there are three persons, each of whom moves around the other two. Of course, C.S. Lewis says it really well. He says, The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit glorify each other. At the center of the universe, self-giving love is the dynamic currency of the Trinitarian life of God. The persons within God exalt, commune with, and defer to one another. When early Greek Christians spoke of perichoresis, this idea of the divine dance, in God, they meant that each divine person harbors the other at the center of his being. In constant movement of overture and acceptance, each person envelops and encircles the other. It's kind of a really beautiful picture, I think, of this kind of relationship that God has in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, deferring to one another, mutual self-love, giving to each other. That's really this call to rejoice, this call to joy, is a call to emulate the, the God that we love and serve, to put God as the center of our universe and our lives, to defer to him, to accept him, to enjoy him. And in this way, we glorify him with our life, our love, and our actions. Now, Jesus is, of course, fulfilling this prophecy in real time. People recognize it. This is why they're responding with this kind of fervor and joy. Jesus is a humble king who instead of demanding worship and honor, he gives his life away to his people so that they would be saved. This is the purpose of him coming the first time. And it's this kind of humility, I think, that really draws us to his beauty, connects us to his joy, people that we are saved, to rejoice in Jesus and who he, has done, who he is and what he has done. And again, this is why Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. There's that commandment again. To write the th same things to you is no trouble to me. And it's safe for you. It's kind of interesting to, to think about what is, what is the most safe thing in our lives. It is to find our joy in Christ. It is to find our satisfaction in the Lord. It's, that's what's truly safe. That's what's truly good for us. The joy that the people were called into in Jerusalem, like I mentioned, was not connected to this present sense of like ease of circumstances. I mean, consider just the Jews at that time in Jerusalem. And they were oppressed by the Roman Empire. Their lives were harsh. It was hard. It was hard work. Yet they were still called to joy and rejoicing. And it reminds us that joy is something that is given by God to his people. It's given by God to his people. It's deeply rooted, rooted reminder that I'm the Lord's. Nothing can take this away. Even though I face difficult circumstances, that joy is still there. God hasn't removed it. He's still with you in it. And in this time, you know, especially at like a year uh, of, of COVID and the pandemic and all this craziness in our country, I know that may, uh, some of us might be feeling uh, like we're struggling with joy. 
right? We might feel like we're struggling with kind of rejoicing in the Lord. We might be feeling depressed, might be feeling lonely or afraid or anxious. And these are emotions that we have perhaps in front of us right now. And it would be wrong to dismiss those. But I think we need to face them and acknowledge if you're feeling that. But we don't stay there. Right? We, don't, we don't live in those places. We acknowledge it and we begin to move uh, towards the Lord with it. We must learn to acknowledge the present emotions that we feel, and then we take them to the Lord. If I'm feeling stressed, the question you begin to ask yourself is, what am I really stressed about? Don't just go to what helps you not feel stressed. Right? Don't go to numbing or escaping. Right? You go to begin to actually get to the deep root causes of what is causing me to feel stressed out. If I'm feeling anxious, the same thing. What is causing this anxiety? If I'm feeling angry, what's the cause for the anger? Anger, usually, uh, specifically, especially anger, is a secondary emotion. I don't know if you guys knew that. Either it's sorrow or fear. It's a secondary emotion based off of something else. And so when I'm feeling angry, the question is, what am I feeling afraid of? What am I sorrowful over that's really causing this other emotion to happen? And often many of our expressed emotions are rooted in three basic negative emotions, fear, guilt, or shame. Okay? I'm afraid of something. Shame is often something is wrong with me. Right? That's what shame is. Guilt is, I have done something wrong. And so when we take these to God, we let him begin to speak into these in our lives, speak into these emotions. So I am feeling fear. We're reminded that God is with us. He's on our side. He's on our team. I don't have anything to fear with God with us. When I'm feeling shame that something is wrong with me, we can be reminded that God is fixed. What is wrong with me? which is our sin nature, and has given us a brand new nature. That is his. With our guilt, God has forgiven us of all the wrong we've ever done or ever will do. These things we take to the Lord and let him speak into that. So how, as we move back to our text of Matthew 21, is how do the people respond now? Because I'm just kind of getting into the background of this prophecy and why it was important for Jesus to have this donkey and the cult and kind of coming in. So now let's begin to focus on the people's reactions. And there's two different groups here that are responding. One is the crowds. The second is the city. Okay, The crowds are responding and the city responds. And those are two separate groups of people that are going on in Jerusalem. The crowd, they honored Jesus as best they could. Right? They honored him as best they could. It seemed kind of impromptu, right? I mean, I don't know if they necessarily ex- expected Jesus to come in that way, but it didn't really ma- matter to him and to them. They, re- they honored him as best they could. It was very humble offerings, very everyday things, right? They're taking off their cloaks or their outer garments, and they're laying on the ground. Uh, and, you know, the streets at the time were not clean, so there was very much like a sacrifice to say, I'm going to take off my coat and put it in this poopy road, and now my coat's poopy, but I'm letting the humble king come and step on my jacket on a poopy road. Uh, But you know what? It's worth it, right? They're giving these very humble offerings, or these tree branches, you know, so the donkey could can step on them uh, on the way into the city. These are not great or glorious offerings, but they were freely and joyfully given. And I believe that this is kind of the call that we have to respond to the Lord, how, what's our heart behind what we're offering to the Lord of our time, our money, our, our energies, our skills? Is it out of duty to impress God? Or is it doing joyfully, out of love? I also believe that we respond to the presence of God in, in freely uh, given ways to serve other people. Serving others has a way of causing us to, at times, temporarily kind of forget ourselves. Right? It takes us oftentimes out of our emotions that we're feeling when we're focused on the other person. I think it is one of God's great gifts to call us to a life of service. And I think in in a life of service, we do find that kind of divine joy. The crowds also responded in hailing Jesus as the Messiah King, as the one who would bring salvation and would be their king. They followed him. They went before him. They were all around him. But notice that Jesus is the one that set the pace for the crowds. If you guys know anything about donkeys, which I am not a donkey expert, but the little I know about donkeys is that they don't go very fast. Am I wrong on that? I don't know if I'm wrong on that. I feel like I'm wrong. I'm right on that. But donkeys don't go very fast. 
you know, and so Jesus is not coming, in, you know, on this war horse, this big beast coming in as a triumphal champion. He's coming in as this humble bearer of burdens, slowly. He's setting the pace for the people. I think at times we need to be open to uh, letting the Lord set the pace for our lives and following him, being with him. So how are we welcoming Jesus into our lives? How are we allowing him to set the pace for our life right now? How are we being called to follow his lead in the unique ways that each of our lives offers? One interesting quote I came across this week uh, from C.S. Lewis was, All joy reminds. I don't know if this is necessarily connected to the passage, but something certainly to int- kind of to think about, right, is joy, all joy reminds us of something else. Joy is something that causes us to look back and to see the good and then to also anticipate the good that's about to be. And we have this in full and perfect measure in Christ, who alone can show us the good which can come out of these difficult circumstances, the difficult things that have been done to us. And he can guarantee the good that will come from all future trials as well. Joy is always there, yet it's not always fully experienced. Notice also the people shouted out praise to God, to Jesus, and Hosanna, to the son of David, this Prophecy is being fulfilled. The son of David would come and sit on his throne forever. We know this to be him. Hosanna, praise be to God. They blessed him. They proclaimed him to be the king. And I think there's something about um, exclaiming our joy that increases the experience of joy. You know, singing oftentimes uh, allows us to kind of feel that inner spirit of joy in us, right? I think there's something important about that. And, and, And for me, I think it's a discipline. We have to kind of discipline ourselves to express joy. Because in the expression of joy, we actually begin to kind of feel that. That's why in Psalm 71, 23, the psalmist says, My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. My soul also, which you have redeemed. And notice the order that is there. Okay? Order is singing praise to the Lord will elicit shouts of joy. And this, I think, is a reminder for us that even in the dark, hard times, in the times we feel tired, wearied, stressed out, anxious, to just maybe, you, you don't have to sing. I'm not a very good vocalist, so don't listen to my singing. And singing is in a way that I connect to the joy of the Lord anyway, oftentimes. But find ways that express joy. Find ways that express uh, thanksgiving to God, and you'll notice that your heart will begin to kind of follow afterwards. Well, our, pa- our passage this morning with the crowds um, in the city beginning to ask this question of who is this man? Who is this guy? And I think that's, Again, like I mentioned, Jesus was not an unknown player. He was not an unknown entity. He was very well known and very well not liked by many of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. So the question behind the question, right? It's like, who is this? That's not the question they're asking. The question they're really asking is, why is he here? What is he going to do? What does this mean? They're fearful. See, the end of our passage, verse 11, uh, said the whole crowd, the whole city was stirred up. Now, the Greek word for that word stirred up is the one to be quaking in fear. That's what the word means, to be quaking in fear, trembling. I think it's very interesting that Jesus' presence here, for some, elicits joy and rejoicing. And in others, elicits kind of this fear and this trembling. Why is that? Well, for one reason, I think it's because the status quo here is being threatened. The status quo is being threatened by Jesus' presence into the city. He's being hailed as a king. Obviously, this is going to cause some trouble for Jerusalem. The Roman government did not like other people trying to usurp their power or their authority, unless they specifically gave it, like in the instance of the puppet King Herod. But here's this other guy who's coming in. Now the Roman soldiers could come with their legions and completely quash this insurrection. So there's a kind of a political fear of potential military attack, of death, because this guy is being hailed as a king, and not in a small way either. I mean, there's crowds, throngs of people are hailing him as the king. I think that something we we have to remember uh, as Christians in a post-Christian era, which we are in, is that our allegiance to Christ, our love for Christ, our faith in the Lord, and uh, our allegiance to one another as believers— our allegiance to him and his word will at times threaten the status quo of the world. It will cause others to become afraid that things are going to get shaken up. 
We may even be seen as the enemies of progress or culture, whatever that means. The world has always been threatened by Jesus. I think we have to remember that. This isn't the first time, and it won't be the last time. He is the light of the world, and his light comes to expose sin. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We have to remember that. We can't have love for the world and love for Christ. We either love Christ or we love the world. These are the two options that we have as believers. So the status quo is being threatened here. The second is that Jesus comes to shake up worship and to restore human dignity. The very first thing that Jesus does when he enters into Jerusalem, verse 12, we're not going to get to it today, but I'll kind of summarize here, is he goes to the temple, right? This beautiful temple that took a long time to build, a center of worship. I mean, all the men, uh, all Jewish men had to come to Jerusalem at that time. So this city was packed with people going to the temple. And, of course, the temple had become a marketplace, you know, Jesus comes, and what is the first thing he does? He drives out the money changers. He drives out the sellers of animals. They'd cluttered up the temple. They'd cluttered up this place of worship. They weren't even allowing uh, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, to come worship, especially the place where they're at with these money changers, these animals, all that kind of stuff, the extortionists, I call them. Uh, that was where the Gentiles were supposed to be able to come freely praying to the Lord. They had blocked it, cluttered it up. Jesus comes as the great shaker of our lives. He shakes up the city by restoring the proper worship, by driving all of these things out of there. Saying, my, play, my, my house, my father's house, this will be a house of prayer. He drives them out. He restores proper worship. He cleanses all the money changers and the sellers of animals, the clutter. See, the Jews had fallen in love with the riches and the profit of the world. That's why they desecrated the temple, just to make a few bucks. And tomorrow is Holy Monday. That's when we actually specifically remember Jesus' entrance to the temple and, and the cleansing of the temple. It's tomorrow. And in, in the meditations uh, tomorrow, we'll take a little bit more look on that, uh, what that means for us today. But it's extremely important. And I think for us, the application is that, you know, Jesus is shaking up the city w- with this, kind of cleaning up worship. I think for us, there are places in our own lives, in our own hearts, that we need Jesus to restore worship. We need Jesus to restore his presence Perhaps our hearts have gotten so cluttered with the stuff in our life, with the worries or the cares of our life. Perhaps uh, we're just too busy, don't have time for the Lord. We need Jesus to come and to shake up our lives, to declutter it. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. uh, The psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to... Ask the Lord to try us, right, to search us, to find those areas in our life that we've cluttered up, that we aren't worshiping the Lord, that we're loving the world instead of him. But he also shakes up the the city by restoring human dignity. At the temple, he declutters the temple. He cleanses it of all this worldliness. But he also heals many people. He goes on a healing spree at the temple. He heals all these people. Uh, and the religious leaders were very angry that Jesus was doing this. They wanted to keep all the desirables out of the way, so they wouldn't have to worry about them or think about them. Remember, Jesus had told a parable, right, about uh, a priest and a Levite walking to a bar. I'm just kidding. Uh, but they told, it's a story about a priest and a Levite, right, who they go and they pass by this guy who had been beat up on the road. It was a very stern rebuke to the fact that these uh, religious leaders were completely ignoring the plights of the people. And Jesus goes to restore dignity to humanity. I think that at times God needs to shake us up to get our attention. I think this past 12 months of COVID, God's been shaking his people up. He's been shaking his church up in so many ways. To what we're to be truly about in our lives, when everything is stripped away, who are you? And what is the purpose of your life? That is the big question I think that the Lord really wants his people to know. I pray that we don't lose sight of the lessons that we've been learning these past 12 months. Well, the third thing is that Jesus was sent to save his people. See, Jesus coming on a donkey uh, in this exact way would have reminded the people of the coming king 
who brings judgment against his enemies. Remember, I mentioned that Zechariah chapter 9 was uh, the place with this Old Testament quotation that Jesus is quoting about him coming into Jerusalem in this particular way. Now, Zechariah is an interesting book of prophecy, and we're not going to get to all of it, but the first half describes this exact thing, the, this Messiah King coming in humility, in righteousness to save his people, but the back half of Zechariah is about the second coming of the king who brings judgment against his enemies. And so for Jesus to come in this way is indicating this is really happening. Also, by the way, judgment's coming. Okay, so just judgment's coming. And it's extremely uh, important for us to remember. It was a way for God to get his people's attention that the king is here. Let's bow in honor and allegiance now that we might be saved. And Jesus himself gives his reason for coming in John chapter 3. And this isn't like the first time Jesus is mentioning this or indicating this. John chapter 3. This is Jesus talking. This might sound familiar, but let's put it in context, right? That's why I'm reading a slightly longer passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We know that. We like that. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, that's great. Let's move on. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people have loved the darkness rather than the light because the works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. I read that whole passage because this is the whole purpose for Jesus coming into the world. One, to save his people from their sins. And how do you do that? Well, he, that's what he says. Whoever does what is true comes to the light. So what's true? What is coming into the light? To believe in the name of the Son of God. To trust in his finished and completed work of life, death, and resurrection. All those who do are guaranteed and given this eternal life. But those who don't are condemned already. So yes, Jesus came to save his people. He came meekly. He came humbly. Riding on the beast of burden showed that he would bear the burden of his people's sin and judgment on their behalf. He didn't come to bring the final judgment yet. However, his coming did condemn all those who reject him to the coming judgment of God Almighty. And so I think this morning we have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make. Will we bow in allegiance and honor to this marvelous king? Or will we keep seeking to be the kings and queens of our own lives, living under the condemnation of God? When our city and our culture sees the way in which God's people are seeking to respond in joy, joy from the Lord in present circumstances, I believe it's a very powerful witness to the truth and power of the gospel that does truly transform lives. I think we're living in a time that there are so many opportunities for the gospel to be seen and experienced. And I believe that responding in joy uh, is oftentimes one of the most powerful testimonies to the truth of the gospel today. So I pray that we may rest in God's lordship in our lives, that we may continue to give of ourselves to others, and that we may respond in joy to the love, the healing, and the hope of God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you're, you're coming on a donkey in humility, saves all of us who believe in you. And Jesus, this morning, I pray that we would turn the eyes of our hearts back to you and bow in honor and love to receive you into our hearts and welcome you as the crowds did with joy and rejoicing. Jesus, I pray that your healing would heal those wounds in our hearts and our minds. Jesus, I pray that your humility would be the strength of our life as we walk with you. Jesus, I pray that right now we would respond in joy as we rejoice and we sing with our mouths, as we meditate on, our, on your word and our hearts, God, as we think about you with our minds. Jesus, I pray that you would be honored, you'd be glorified, and we rejoice with great joy and exceeding gladness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.